Hello and welcome to Reporters on France 24. I'm Delano D'Souza. In this edition, we head to Crimea, a region in southern Ukraine annexed by Russia back in 2014. One community in Crimea that to this day remain pro-Kiev Crimean Tartars. Under Russian rule, they have been trying to preserve Ukrainian culture. Vocal critics from the community have been subjected to arrest and even intimidation. Global NGOs like Amnesty International have raised concerns over freedom of expression. And as you will see in this report, Crimean Tartars say they want out. Elena Voloshin reports. The capital of Crimea and a gathering for the anniversary of the annexation. People have met here around a monument to unidentified Russian soldiers to praise them for invading Crimea and reincorporating it into Russia. In Crimea, authorities actively promote the public glorification of the annexation. But here, it looks as though fewer than 300 people have turned out. Security forces, school children and pensioners. Three years ago, however, in the same place, there was a massive crowd and both sides were out in force. The Tatars were among the most pro-Ukrainian groups a Crimean ethnic minority still fiercely opposed to the annexation. Ilmi Umarov is one of the leaders of the Mejlis, the representative body of the Crimean Tatars. It's been labelled extremist and banned by the new Russian authorities. Here I'm speaking about sanctions that are supposed to force Russia to renounce Crimea and Ukraine's eastern territories. This phrase was taken out of context and served as a pretext to open a judicial inquiry against me for publicly calling into question Russia's territorial integrity. For this interview on the Tata ATR channel, also banned in Crimea since the annexation, Ilmi Umarov faces four years in prison. He fell ill during his court hearing and was taken to hospital. The FSB then transferred him by force to a psychiatric centre, where he was made to stay for three weeks. The vast majority of Crimean Tatars don't recognise the occupying authorities and don't consider Crimea to be Russian territory. I think that's why they're prosecuting me. They've decided to create a climate of fear. The authorities want the Tatar people and their representatives to keep quiet. They present that as a validation of the new regime. Faced with discontent from part of the population, Russia's deployed all the tools at its disposal in the police and the justice system. In the early hours of the morning, an anti-terror police operation is underway in a suburb of Simferopol. The target, the house of a Tata activist who has lent his support to families of those in prison. He's just been arrested along with 10 other members of the community who came to observe. The police said through a loudspeaker that all the people here are breaking the law because they're blocking cars and passers-by. But actually, nothing's getting through anyway. They've closed off the area. Riot police are constantly filming the small group that's still here, and us too, as we film what's happening. These images will be used in court hearings. They'll also be used to make new arrests. Once the police have left, we go into the activist's house. The lock isn't shut, take it off. His wife doesn't know why he's been arrested. He's never been in trouble with the police. There's no sign of this coming. I didn't expect it at all. I'm still in shock. The accused will be brought to court for an immediate trial. 
We later learn it's on the grounds of a post the activist wrote on social media back in 2014. In it, he gave his best wishes for Ramadan, along with a flag of the Islamist group Hizb ut tahrir Outlawed in Russia, but not in Ukraine, 19 presumed members of the organisation have had legal proceedings brought against them since annexation. But today's actions look more like intimidation. It's almost midnight by the time the hearings finish. The 10 Tatars who came to support the activist are given five days in prison. The activist himself gets 11 days for the photo he posted. On leaving the court, the community's lawyers want to show us a report aired a little earlier on a Russian TV channel. These images have nothing to do with what happened today. They're archive images. And the arrests aren't at all related to any suspicion of affiliation with the group Hizb ut tahrir It's propaganda. They're distorting the truth about what's going on in Crimea. They're doing it to poison the situation and stick the terrorist label on the Crimean Tatars. The lawyers get little sleep. Early the next day, Erdem Semedlaev pleads yet another case. We catch him outside a different court where all morning he's defended one of the Tatars in prison since 2015 for demonstrating during the annexation. Come on, we've got to eat quickly. We have to get back to work. The trials take place almost daily and the community has organised itself. Volunteers hand out soup in front of the courts. People come a long way to attend these trials. Some don't have time to eat breakfast, and they go home late at night. Thanks to this, we're able to keep going. After the meal, Edim goes back to his law firm. Police carried out a raid here a month ago. All their equipment and documentation was seized. They rifled through our criminal cases. I kept telling them the computers belong to the lawyers and that it's a violation of the legal right to confidentiality. As you can see, the tables are empty. Now we don't have enough computers. We take turns. It's all very difficult. That day, Emil Korbudinov was also arrested and sentenced to 10 days in custody for a post he wrote on social media in 2013. There were several hearings over those 10 days when they extended the time my clients were in pre-trial detention. But the Tatars aren't the only ones put under pressure by the authorities. In a report from the end of last year, Amnesty International denounced a systematic clampdown on freedom of expression in Crimea. In this village in northern Crimea, we meet with Natalia and her daughter-in-law. Natalia's son has been in prison since last December. Vladimir Baluk planted a Ukrainian flag on his roof. He also placed a sign on a wall of his house, which read, Street of the Heroes Killed on Maidan. When he put up that street sign, members of the city council came and threatened to have him thrown in jail. The farmer was arrested 10 days later. They came in four cars, armed and wearing balaclavas, like they were arresting a criminal, a terrorist, as they told me. They repeatedly accused him of refusing to accept a Russian passport. The police said they found ammunition and two kilos of explosives in the attic. But the family believes it was a setup. They'd already threatened him, insinuated they could find ammunition, drugs or other things. In fact, he expected it would happen. The case produced an outcry. The Russian NGO, Memorial, declared Baluch a political prisoner. 
we decided to get the official side of the story and speak to the Human Rights Commissioner with the Crimean government. What can you tell us about the Vladimir Balu case? I don't know that case. Who's Balu? When we bring up the ammunition and the Maidan Hero Street sign, we find it's the former that shocks the ombudsman the most. Do you find it acceptable that someone puts a sign up saying, I support fascism? But he didn't write, I support fascism. Heroes of Maidan Street, to me, that means I support fascism, or I support Ukraine's fascist coup. The laws of the Russian Federation are right to punish these people for expressing this kind of extremist or fascist sentiment. That's my opinion. The voices of dissidents are raised less and less in Crimea. Andrei, another activist, takes us to the last Ukrainian bastion on the peninsula. The Ukrainian Cultural Centre in Simferopol is just a small room that survives thanks to donations and the savings of its founder, Leonid. Here's part of our library. Not all the books are here. The others are back there in that cupboard in those boxes, because we don't have space to put them out. And these small leaflets explain the rights of people who are under arrest. Our colleagues from the Crimean Human Rights Mission gave them to us. Leonid is clear. His goal is to preserve Ukrainian culture, not get involved in politics. However, Russian authorities see his centre as a threat. All our cultural events finish the same way. We have to deal with the Centre for the Fight Against Extremism and the FSB, and we receive warnings. The Public Prosecutor's Office wrote in one of them that they openly suspect that we are agitators. They say that with our symbols and Ukrainian slogans, we're provoking the police to use force against us. In 2015, Leonid was fired from his job as a teacher. I was told at the time, enemies of the state cannot work for us. Andrei has also lost his job. He and his wife, like so many other pro-Ukrainians, plan to leave Crimea. Moscow and join Elena Voloshin, who filmed that report. Elena, can you tell us about the conditions which you filmed in? Well, my working conditions were quite reasonable in Crimea because I have an accreditation uh, from the Russian Foreign Ministry, which means local authorities respect that. Um, the only difficulty that I've had is that during the court cases, the judges uh, would systematically refuse me to uh, make some footage, uh, although Russian law, opposite to other countries, uh, usually allows journalists to make footage and uh, take pictures during the trials. Uh, however, local journalists are the ones who really face uh, troubles uh, there in Crimea. Several of them uh, are being in trial now because they've criticized uh, annexation in their media and all the independent media have been shut down uh, by the Crimean authorities, which means that the only perspective that uh, local journalists have now is to make propaganda for the authorities. What is the military situation like now on the ground in East Ukraine? And Eastern Ukraine also, it's quite difficult to get an accurate information because there too, uh, there's the problem that uh, very few uh, independent journalists work on the ground. However, uh, we know that uh, the ceasefire is being uh, broken regularly and uh, even at some points of the front line, there are heavy fightings. And this war uh, still makes casualties every week uh, in Eastern Ukraine. But the most recent news is that the Ukrainian authorities have uh, declared a road blockade and a railway blockade of the Separatist held territories uh, to protest against the violation of Minsk agreements and also to protest against the seizure uh, by the self proclaimed uh, separatist authorities of the companies and the industries uh, which uh, have Ukrainian owners uh, outside these territories. Now, Europe put in place sanctions against Russia in response to the annexation of Crimea. Are they having any effect? 
Well, the European and the U.S. Uh, sanctions, uh, they really impacted a uh, Russian economy, but certainly less than the oil prices, uh, and the oil prices are now recovering, which means that uh, Russia's economy is stabilizing, and uh, indicators such of, uh, as uh, inflation are currently uh, stabilizing. So experts are united to say that these sanctions have clearly uh, haven't been enough to force uh, Vladimir Putin to change his position. Uh, uh, as well for Ukraine and for Syria. And uh, talking about Crimea, Russia is now building a bridge uh, over the Kerch Strait to physically link uh, Crimea to Russia. Uh, this bridge, the road and railway bridge, uh, costs 3.7 billion uh, euros, which means that clearly uh, Russia have no intention to uh, ever return Crimea back to Ukraine. Elena Voloshin, thank you very much for speaking to us from Moscow. That's it for this edition of Reporters. Until next time, thank you very much for watching.